Um, hello, this is the uh, uh, second uh, Zoom gathering about the fantastic film Kill Chain. Uh, this gathering is sponsored by uh, Lori Grace, uh, who's on with us, and engineered by Mike Hirsch. I am your uh, moderator, uh, Harvey Sluggo Wasserman. I call myself Sluggo to differentiate myself from that guy who's in prison for all those sex crimes. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we are thrilled to have the, the uh, maker uh, of this uh, fabulous film, Kill Chain, uh, Russ Michaels with us. I do want to begin the meeting with uh, two pieces of good news. Number one, uh, Shinzo Abe, the horrendous uh, prime minister, pro-nuclear prime minister of Japan, will be stepping down. We don't know if the, the guy who's going to come after him, or will be a guy, unfortunately, uh, is going to be worse. But it's hard to imagine anybody worse running Japan than Shinzo Abe. And he will be gone, which we like. And number two, um, and this is a big one. I've worked with Jennifer Tanner and others on this. Um, uh, a while ago, the Atlanta Hawks offered their arena as a voting center in, in Atlanta. And there are a huge number of advantages to voting in a sports arena or a sports stadium. And I wrote a piece about it at, uh, that went around on the internet at, at uh, Reader Supported News. And we've been pushing this. And now it's turned into a tidal wave. Uh, on one of our calls, uh, many of our calls, we've had Jennifer Roberts who's the uh, former mayor of Charlotte, and she went to the election board in Charlotte, and they will be using the football stadium and the basketball arena in um, Charlotte for early voting. And now it is spread, and <laughs> it's mind-boggling, they will be using for early voting as a voting center, Madison Square Garden and the- Wow. <laughs> so this is a big deal. Also, Pittsburgh, Washington, D.C., and a number of other cities are, are coming on board. So this is a big deal. I believe, actually, that LeBron James is, is behind part of it. So, and Jennifer's been working with his people. So it's a big deal, a very big deal, because, you know, they'll be able to ban guns, for God's sakes, and people can sit in, out of the weather. There'll be facilities. There may even be food. I mean, it, it's a huge step forward in the history of voting in the United States. And I think we should all take a little a pat on the back for that one. It, it will make a difference. Wow. And I, I believe it will spread to virtually all the major cities. So uh, it's a big deal. And John, I'm sure you can get the Phoenix Suns Arena uh, lined up and, and uh, maybe even the football stadium, we'll see. Okay, so that's the good news. Um, um, we are gonna, and the other good news, the, the better news is we have Russ Michaels with us, uh, a charming fellow talking to us from England, um, uh, and our former boss. At this point in time, I think we'd take King George back again, but um, uh, Russ, uh, you've made this phenomenal film, Kill Chain. Uh, we had a, a 90 minute session on it a while ago, thanks to Lori Grace, and now we've got this other one. So uh, we'd like you to talk, and then of course, high on our agenda, and you can decide when you wanna start talking about this, is the vulnerability or lack thereof of the digital uh, ballot uh, counting machines, the digital imaging machines, which are at the tail end now, of the uh, voting process in the United States, a very high percentage of the ballots in this election will be counted on electronic uh, imaging machines. And so we need to know from you what you think about the hackability, but you have much to say about this phenomenal film. So uh, let's, uh, let's, without further ado, uh, turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, well, thanks to everybody. Uh, I, I'd like to say, first of all, Thank you for watching the film. And the filmmakers aren't just, it's not just myself. Um, my co-producer in London, Simon Ardizoni, was co-producer, co-director, and in New York, Sarah Teal, and our producer in New York, Michael Hershorn. So there's four of us behind this, not just me, um, but I was the kind of investigative producer. Um, and kind of my job was to find things that hopefully, you know, a lot of people didn't know about before. That was a primary uh, mission of mine. Um, uh, I'll, I'll lead up towards the end of the film because there's something, I hope everyone made it to the end of the film. There's something there that taught me the biggest lesson in much of my research. I, we started in 2003, unbelievably, on Hacking Democracy, which was the precursor to Kill Chain. And the full title is Kill Chain, The Cyber War on America's Elections, which is a little bit of a mouthful, I know, but that's the full title. Um, and in that first film, uh, we realized how hard it was to just get behind the curtain and understand what was going on inside black box voting. Um, Bev Harris 
the, her work featured very heavily in the original film. Um, but towards the end of that, I organized the hacking of Florida's election system, the Diebold election system that you saw a clip of in Kill Chain. That's a cut down version of what, were, what became called the Hursty hack. And Harry Hursty is a really extraordinary man. I was walking around a swimming pool with him in Tallahassee, Florida, and he said, I think I've worked out how is the election can be stolen using negative minus votes. And I thought, my goodness, if we can get that on camera, we, we've solved the question, can it be hacked? And indeed, that's what he did. So I organized the hacking of Leon County system, but with the permission of Ion Sancho, so I, nobody went to prison. Um, and that really was an earthquake. Um, no one had ever hacked, or at least admitting to it, uh, an American election system in use in America. Uh, since then, uh, secretaries of states have authorized scientists like Professor Alex Holderman, who appears in Kill Chain, to, to, to see what you can do to get in. But this, that's in laboratories, that's in universities. This was in the building, in the room, where John Kerry and George W. Bush's votes were entered, and we were in that room. Hari was outside the room, and he managed to affect the vote using one and only one memory card that he'd, uh, let's say, tinkered with. So that, that kind of opened up the door. What it did what was most important, I think, was it, it threw out this idea that you're a conspiracy theorist, a Luddite, if you think these things can be hacked. They can, and it's been proven now, but we were the first. So we're very proud of that. The film was nominated for an Emmy Award. And coming into the second film, when HBO said, yes, we, we want a, a sequel to this, um, Clearly, Russia is a major threat, but there are obviously others. My first question was, how much has changed? And the, the good thing is, there's a lot of paper. You used to have touchscreen machines everywhere, really. And now you've got a lot of paper ballots that can be, can be audited, can be counted, not just by the electronic machines, but by humans' hand-eye counts. And that's, I think that's the best thing that's happened. But I wanted to know, what else were these machines, had these machines been, you know, fixed in a good way? Could, could the old kind of hacks still be done? Was it still open to the stuff you could learn about on the internet? And so could Russian uh, secret service. Um, and what we found really was there are a few patches, a few fixes here and there, but the vulnerabilities are still absolutely dire. And in fact, Alex, what isn't in Kill Chain is that Alex Holderman, professor in University of Michigan, he, in 2018, at my request, he, he looked into the touch screens called the TSX. These are the ones in the film that I found, and actually it was Susan Pinchon in Florida, originally found that they were for sale on eBay. So I found the warehouse that 1,200 of these machines were stored in, and the lovely guy there agreed that we could film there and interview him, and we brought Harry Hursty along. Could those machines still be hacked in the same way they could in, in 2005? Um, and the answer seems to be yes. So there are still terrible problems, but the scanners that you put all the ballots through are in just about, I think, every state now, and that's great. So count the paper to check the electronic results. Um, now, Hari told me a little bit of a secret, which I don't think I need to ask him if I can say anything about it. In 2007, Hari Hursty was hired by the Secretary of State of Ohio. Diebold didn't know he was being hired as another scientist to look into every system in that state. And they produced a report called the Everest Report and it, it detailed terrible things. They, all the vendors had to produce their code and give it to the Secretary of State. And Diebold's, when they went to look for it in the archive, it wasn't there. So they said to Diebold, you, you have to give this over right now. So they hurried and they quick, they, they got it on a disc and they sent it. Uh, and Harry Hursty, unknown to Diebold, was working for the Secretary of State. And he said, huh, I'm gonna look at the bit of code where in 2006, I found you could upload a virus. And apparently that had been fixed. What he saw when he looked at that bit of the code in the TSX touchscreen was that that bit of code hadn't been removed 
extra lines of code had been written in. Totally unnecessary, he said. In fact, he said, for this, there is no innocent explanation. So that kind of is how Kill Chain started. I wondered whether anything nefarious could be proven, um, whether, <laughs> whether a broadcaster like HBO would allow us to put it on camera. And in that, and that journey, I, we examined the voting machines. We found there was code that could be bad code, could be piggybacked on top of it. It made a very, very technical kind of science-based film. And, and I, I didn't know if we could make it understandable just to, you know, it, it's really quite serious software science. But then I found a guy called Cyberzeist. And he hadn't been reported about in the press. And if you made it to the end of the film, you'll know who Cyberzeist is. He's a foreign hacker. He tried to get attention to himself in 2016. He said, I'm in to Alaska's system and I've got access to the GEMS tabulate. GEMS is, I think it's in about 15 states still. It's the central tabulator in the middle of the system and all the votes feed into it. And that guy is what I learned, my discovery for making this film is I, I thought a virus getting in to change the votes was probably one of the worst things could happen from a foreign state actor maybe. Second worst thing that could happen could be an insider in an elections office who's corrupt and wants to change the votes for their own election or for a senator or somebody that they're supporting. But what I found was, and this shocked me, what Cyberzeist claims, and we, we, I can, if anyone wants to think of some questions based on the film, I will answer them afterwards, especially about this. Cyberzeist is an Indian hacker. He didn't leave India. He accessed Alaska's central vote counting computer from Alaska, from India, sorry. And what he did was he got inside as an administrator, administrative access. So I, I realized that let's say America is a company like America Inc. And there are 12 CEOs who all have access to the most secret sensitive information. What Cyberzeist maybe realized with the access he'd managed to get two days before the presidential election in 2016, one day before, and then he got deeper in on election day, was that none of the people in Alaska running this system that the votes were just about to pour into from all the machines uploaded onto memory cards, stuck in the main computer and then tabulated, was that they had, or America Inc, let's say, 12 CEOs who all know each other, all running the system. They had a 13th. And if that was someone from Putin's security services, intelligence services, or a rogue hacker out in, I don't know, California, Florida somewhere, or someone from North Korea, that represents the biggest threat, I think, to America's elections, because Cyberzeist could, I, I have no reason to believe that Cyberzeist is still not in Alaska's system. If Russia or somebody else had tried to get in in 2015, around the country, many of the systems are the same as you had then. So I realized that there was an insider attack with somebody like a sort of spider waiting in the middle of the web biding their time who could at the right moment affect an election change but they've already hacked in so I, I'd just like to ask everybody if you could think of a question based on that because that to me was my big learning curve that, that that could be going on in one of the jurisdictions or 20 of them around the country right now someone's waiting for the votes to come in so that that was that was shocking to me and uh, Cyber's Ice took a, took a risk giving us an interview because he's admitting on camera to a crime uh, um, but he wanted people to know you are this vulnerable it is this dangerous. Um, Harvey you mentioned that the ballots you know many mail-in ballots are going to be coming in soon starting in September I think. Um, the machines that are going to be counting those shouldn't be connected to the internet we're told that sometimes they are, but I, I'll just give you a story based on something I learned in New York. Um, this isn't in the film. New York would not, New York's, this is New York NYC, not New York State. 
um, they wouldn't let our camera people in to film what the count, the proof of the count was. What they do is they put USB sticks in all the voting machines, they're reasonably new machines, and those, 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 those machines send their, if this isn't clear, forgive me, they send on election night out the results for the press. They send it to a, a server in a building in New York. And they said, it's safe, it's safe, because that's just for the press. We don't send those via wireless modem to uh, the place we're actually gonna count the votes. That's in a different building. Those, all those votes come in on USB sticks and they're, and they're secure. <laughs> and I thought, okay, that, that depends on your security with your USB sticks. So you, now bear with me, you've got a USB stick in the machine which comes out and another USB stick which stays in and broadcasts the results to a building in New York. Those are all going round in a circle. They use the same USB sticks over and over and over for different elections. Yeah. So they've exposed the system to wireless. They send, it's actually basically a, a cell phone call. They use cell phone masts to send the votes, unofficial votes to a building in New York and say to the press, oh, um, Hillary Clinton's winning or Senator blah, blah is winning and this, this is what the results are just for tonight. We'll give you the final result in, in a week or two. But they've exposed the whole system through these USB sticks to a hack that could come in via the wireless modem. All these machines have wireless modems. Now you've got, you've got the entire system set up this way where you're using USB sticks. And I've never heard anyone around the country tell me Oh, we, no, no, we order in brand new USB sticks for every election. So they're all virgin and, you know, untouched by cyber hand. And I think that is extraordinarily risky because you've now got these, 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 these USB sticks, which, which can hold enormous amounts of code. In fact, there's a report online called Bad USB. That was a discovery in 2014 where somebody could manipulate your entire computer system just by using the little computer in a USB. So there's so many, the point I'm trying to make is that there are so many points of attack. Once you have an electronic system, you can think you've battened down this bit and battened down that actually what you've done is you've left the back door wide open. And I was surprised that that was still the case in 2016, 17, 18 and 19. And so I don't believe that's changed terribly much. And that was the problem still in 2003 and four when we started. So I don't think there's been many improvements. I, I don't know how long you want me to talk for, but I-, I Well, why don't I think we jump the, in, uh, um, if, if it's all right. Um, yeah. Well, um, I'm looking at the um, participant list. If you want to jump in, uh, raise your hand. I did want to call on John Brakey, who is our resident expert in the, uh, in the digital imaging machines. Uh, John, I'm sure you're brimming with questions. Um, 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 uh, have you met before, the two of you? Yes. Yeah, we have. Okay. It's so. a fabulous movie, Michael. And thank you for your work. Well, and Russ, uh, Russ, uh, Russ, my Michael. question <laughs> would be that I think very pertinent what you're talking about is that, you know, we have five states uh, in the United States right now, Michigan, Florida, Rhode Island, Wisconsin, and I can't think the other one offhand, that are using what they call a virtual private network. And then, of course, uh, which is going over the internet, okay, that's the precinct scanner that connects to the tabulator through a cellular modem. And, uh, and then we find out just recently, even though some people knew beforehand, because, you know, when I was in Wisconsin in 2016, we found VPN there, me and Chris Sauter. And we went to the head guy of uh, Wisconsin, and we asked him, uh, how could this be? And what he said was, hey, don't look at me. You know, uh, blame, the, uh, blame the EAC. They certified it. And the reality is the EAC did not certify it. Oh, wow. and, uh, and this is all over the country that we don't know how many other states are partially using it or it's built into the system. Uh, we wonder about North Carolina. But, but your thoughts on it, and thank you. Um, the modems are 
Number one, unnecessary. I think you'd agree, John. Yes. To stick a modem in, in a machine that uh, has to be secured from hackers, I think is insanity. Um, the fact that ESNS is the company I think you're talking about that said yes. our modems are certified as part of this system, so it's proper and all been tested. Uh, it turned out that they had been lying about that. And yet, you have to blame the states and the counties more, I think, than the company, because they know what a modem is and they decided to have it. I think Alabama may have decided not to. I think Alabama said, supply your machines without modems. And that proves that ESNS can do it. When they're ordered to, they can take the modems out and supply the machines and the machines will hopefully count the ballots accurately. But this is one of the big problems. I think, you're, John, what, maybe what you're getting at really underneath all this as well is that really what election officials on the whole want is an easier job. Hmm. And the vendors selling these systems know that anything they do that can make it easier They'll, they'll design in. Oh, you can upload the election re results on election night, send them via a cell phone modem and have them in your head office in seconds. It's easy. It's easy, but it's damn insecure. And if you... I would also say that it's laughable to think that an America's worst election enemies, uh, you know, whether it's Russia or... Iran or North Korea or just some guy who's really interested in causing chaos because he thinks it's fun. Who knows? Those people know this too. They know what the systems are if they really research it. Um, and I think that election officials saying yes to stuff that's dangerous is one of the biggest problems. Well, John, you're uh, familiar with the, um, uh, the digital scanning devices. Uh, around the country, John Brakey, how many of them have um, internet uh, vulnerability? What percentage? I mean, what, how do we know? The, from what we looked at, it's really five states, and uh, and I really don't know more than that uh, where these are because you know they say they don't allow them, they've outlawed them. You can see that when I go into the states I've been in and studied. That, uh, these are the only five states out of the 20 that I've heavily surveyed. Now, there's 30 other states. I don't know exactly what's going on there, uh, but I think that those are the big five. And they're swing states, too. We know that so, Florida is using them. But we do know, and that's another part of the question uh, for our guest here, is that, uh, you know, he knows Benny Smith, he knows Fraction Magic, and, uh, you know, and, and his... We believe, Benny, me, and many others know that fraction magic can change the numbers on the fly, but it cannot change a hand-marked paper ballot. And that's something we fight for. That's the most important document. The next document is the ballot image because it's in the chain of custody. And we believe that they don't have the technology to change on a massive level without uh, creating problems. So what do they do? They destroy the images. They trivialize them. Okay, they don't want people to know that the machine didn't count the ballot. And me and Susan and many others and people on this call are fighting to make sure that these elections are transparent. And we see the vulnerability in the system is probably going to be in the vote by mail, not people mailing them in, but they're, if they're not sorting these ballots into precincts, then the only way you're going to sort them is with the images. And if they're destroying the images, Hello, everybody. We got a problem. I'd love to see Russ Michael's thoughts on that. Um, thanks, John. I, I think the ballot images are incredibly important. Um, in fact, I, I found an ESNS voting machine brochure that I sent you to help you, I think, with your lawsuit some years right. ago. In that, the company, the vendor themselves, says in a question and answer to San Francisco's um, election officials, I think it was, Yes, these ballot images, which are, you know, digital photographs, really, of every ballot, um, and they're stored in files. These can be used by the public to check or audit an election if they want to. So the, the vendor themselves admitted that this is a really good audit system to reassure the public and maybe get them involved as well. You, you're not going to be able to do anything to it if you've got to, if you put the, the ballot images on a website and say, hey, do you want to just help us check this election? Then you can. Um, 
But it seems, and I think Florida seems to be a really good state to illustrate this, it seems that some election officials are very happy to say, well, just push that button and the machine will record a picture of every ballot and we can store those and keep them on a hard drive somewhere for safety and for auditing. And many other election officials are saying, ah, I'm not pushing that button, I don't want that. I don't want that to be part of the records of the election that I have to legally protect, keep, and make available to the public and the candidates, why not? Um, and so there seems to be, the question's why? I'd like to ask anyone on this, on this meeting, uh, why do you think election officials are frightened, some of them, of having a publicly checkable count of the ballots? Well, that's a $64 trillion question. Um, um, has anybody got a quick answer? I mean, I think at this point, it might be good uh, to talk with John um, about his legal case. I'm not sure uh, we discussed it on our previous Monday Zoom. And by the way, there will be a Zoom call tomorrow, our 16th, uh, Monday, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, contact me in the chat or at solartopia at gmail uh, for our 90 minute um, assault on the, the details of the election. Um, and it's nine weeks to Armageddon and, uh, and do join us. Uh, in the last one, we had a detailed discussion of John Brakey's legal case uh, in Florida. And I attempted, and John, I'll attempt again to summarize, and maybe Russ, I don't know if you know about it and how many other people on the call know about it, but John Brakey uh, and his crew went into court in Florida because the uh, election um, <coughs> county officials have been um, discarding the digital images, which is insane, of course. And uh, John, correct me if I'm wrong, they went into court, uh, you sued, uh, you can tell us how many uh, counties you sued. They lied and said that they did not have the, you know, the computer capability of, of preserving these images, which is utterly ridiculous. Uh, but they did agree that um, if there's a recount, they will re-enter the, the paper ballots that come in and then use those digital images. Is that a, is that a correct uh, a summary, John Brakey? Yeah, and it was eight counties is what it was. And uh, we'll be back in court in November. Uh, we basically had to do this because of uh, they were appealing and that was gonna happen. So it gave us leverage to at least get that deal, okay? And get them to recognize that the base system could do it. And, uh, and I would say this is that uh, uh, getting back to something that, that our guests asked is that, you know, he asked, what about these election departments? What are they hiding? And, and you know, simply, and Susan ought to jump in on this, is Susan Pinchuk, because she's on the call, is that it's sometimes, it's what they call dust bunnies. That's what they found in Wisconsin. They had a 30% overvote, okay? Nobody was checking the numbers, and it was, and so they don't trust their own system a lot of times, okay? Uh, but I do know that there's solutions to building a system is now, since we have digital imagery, the future is already here. Some counties are using it, is electronic adjudication. That way these election directors will be very confident when they put results out, uh, if they electronically adjudicate. I'm gonna give you a quick statistic, which is a mind boggler that blows me and Susan away. In Maricopa County, they counted 800,000 ballots. And they had to adjudicate 10% of those ballots. Why? Because of overvotes in write-ins, and these are only vote-by-mail ballots. 70% was uh, write-ins and getting them recorded properly. The other 30% was voters' errors, but you could see clearly voter intent on a large majority of these, approximately, probably 25,000 votes they found and they do that before election night. And they do that with two people from opposite parties, cameras above, a third person roaming around. If they don't agree, they have to raise their hand. And then the judge will come over and make the decision with one of them. Was it a vote or is it an overvote? It's exciting to see that because they're capable of putting out really good information that we can trust and that people should verify. And they should be proud to show this stuff. I know Maricopa is. But anyway, 
that I wanted to answer our guests that question. It's both reasons, fraud and incompetency. That's what they're hiding. Harvey, sometimes. Harvey. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, take us. I mean, the fundamental question, I mean, uh, Russ is asking the key question right here. I asked that very question at a group called the American Political Science Association. Are American elections legitimate? Same question I asked uh, in 1994 when I was the election observer and wrote the UN report in El Salvador after the revolution. Uh, and if you think about this, uh, how come we have private, for-profit, partisan entities in our voting system? If I w when I was down after the Civil War uh, in the election, if the Arena Party, the right-wing fascists, and the FMLN, if one of them said, no problem, I'm bringing in some private, non-transparent, for-profit entities associated with the CIA, and they're going to count the vote. The only way we could have that election were clear containers and paper ballot. Each side wanted to see who in the hell was touching the ballots. In the US, as Russ points out in his movie, why it's so good, you don't know whether it's legitimate or not. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, and nobody, uh, the political scientists like the numbers. Leave us alone. Let us play with these numbers. We don't care whether they're legitimate or not. That's how we get tenure. Amazing. Uh, Jennifer Tanner, you had a comment? Jennifer, unmute. I'm looking at the chat. It's going to be Jennifer and then um, uh, uh, Gary Crane and then Steve Rosenfeld and Mimi Kennedy. Uh, Jennifer, did you want to say something, Jennifer? She's still there? There you are. Are you got to unmute? There we go. Okay, um, I was just, John Brakey told me a story in a court case, and John, you probably want to go on. The, 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 the judge asked the man, why do you not make sure that the numbers are correct? Why do you change them later? And he said, well, we can't have people knowing about them because then they don't match. And, and the judge said, well, that's the whole point. They're supposed to, if they don't match, go check and figure it out. Don't just artificially. Did you want to talk about that, John? I mean, it's a perfect answer. John, break it. Because Susan can explain that story a lot better. Susan, you there? Because it's very true what she said. Uh, and I don't want to give hearsay. Susan has firsthand information. Susan Pinchon, are we mu unmuted? Are you with us? I'm looking for you here. There you are. You're unmuted, Susan. Hi. Hi, Harvey. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes. Oh, okay, hi. That, Jennifer, thanks for mentioning that story. That actually is the man who is currently the supervisor of elections in Broward County, Florida, Peter Antonacci. That, this was uh, back in 2006. He was working as general counsel for the state of Florida. And it was a Florida Supreme Court case where the citizens of Sarasota County wanted a better audit than the state audit. The Florida state audit for elections is pretty meaningless. So they were in the Florida Supreme Court and the judge asked him, why shouldn't Sarasota County have a better audit than the state? And, um, and Peter Antonacci replied, but your honor, as sure as night follows day, there will be inconsistencies in the election results. And then those inconsistencies will be known as though that was the most horrible thing in the world. So, and the judge said, but isn't that see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil? Isn't that the purpose of an audit? So again, this is the man who is currently the supervisor of elections for the second largest county in Florida. And that was his attitude about transparency. Uh, he was appointed by Governor Rick Scott. He will not be running for re-election in November. But it just portrays an attitude that I think is too prevalent in this country, which is, you know, what's not the, remember R. Doug Lewis, who founded the Election Center, once said, the only good election is one where nobody really knows what happens. 
So there is that attitude. And I think that some of it, this, and then I'll turn it back over, but um, I think that some of this in the Florida lawsuit is just simply, um, simply not wanting to take a chance that something might reveal an inconsistency in election results. Thank you. And that's why electronic adjudication is a future because they don't have faith in their own system. They, uh, they're trained that a good elections administrator is an administrator who can hide all the warts. And when you teach people that kind of behavior, you're training sociopaths. He was a person who worked the other eight counties to get them to make statements that are outrageous, that this would cost millions of dollars to save these images, but not one letter from ESNS in this document saying that their system was not capable. Terrible. It's amazing. Harvey? Yes. I, I'd like to comment on something. Please. Um, I've been involved since 04, and what I observe um, <clears throat> is uh, both with uh, uh, voting registrar, I mean, election registrars and Edison Media Research, where Bob and I put forth a lawsuit to, uh, about them changing results, is that these companies and these people, these elected and appointed registrars, they want to stay in business. They're, you know, they're appointed, they're elected, they don't want something happening on their watch. Now, we've said that in different ways, but I just want to confirm that. And what, when I used to talk to Carolyn Cernich from Humboldt County, who worked with the Trackenberg system, she had to defend that if there's even one vote that seems out, and they did double counting with Hard InterCivic and the Trackenberg system, that she that that would cause call for a recount. And so I want to bring out that the system has a lot to do with election professionals remaining in, in their office and, and being more committed to that. But I do want to say that Carolyn Cernich and Virginia Martin from Columbus County and others in New York show a different kind of registrar. And I hope that more of them will show up. Russ, Martin, Russ uh, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I'm very glad Laurie mentioned Virginia Martin. Um, I, I believe she may be leaving office. I, I hope she's still in for this election. She's one of America's best election officials, and it's really good to know. You know, you have people who are dedicated to the job, dedicated mm -hmm. to getting an honest result, correct result out, and if it's not correct, I think she would say so. So she has a system made by Dominion Voting Systems, which is a, actually a Canadian company. And the way I understand it is that when she took the post of elections commissioner for Columbia County, New York state, uh, she said, I'll use the machines, but I want my Republican partner in, in, in this job as well and myself to do a hand audit so we can check that the, the, number, the, the, the numbers, the results that the machines produce at the end actually are match what the ballots say was cast. Um, and when I spoke to her, she said, the important thing to know is that what we do here, and we don't, they don't, I think I didn't count every race and every single ballot. They did a really good, maybe 60%, 80% of an election. And it's not a vast county, but she said it cost us 1% of our budget. And that's scalable. If you're LA, if you're New York, if you're a large county in Florida, 1% of your budget will guarantee that the electronic machines producing a result match or maybe don't occasionally with the actual paper that's in a warehouse and this is why at the end of my film kill chain i was determined to get our camera into the warehouse with sorry the where's the warehouse where the ballots were stored from 2016 and there's in um i can't remember the city it's um it's where joe biden came from originally i think uh, Scranton. Yes, Scranton. There's uh, a paper plant, paper shredding plant. And that's where a large number of the 2016 ballots were destined to be turned into pulp. And I, I really wanted to get my camera in there because that's the evidence of the election. And this is what's, this is the sort of crazy thing. If you tell somebody outside America, oh, they, they put the ballots through 
ballot counting machines, they put them on in boxes, they store them for the requisite 22 months in warehouses, they keep them dry, they keep them safe, hopefully. And then without anybody auditing or checking that the computer was correct, they then send all that to a paper shredding plant. And so to see that going into the machine and being mushed up with Hillary Clinton votes and Trump votes, <laughs> that to me is, is the point. You're destroying the evidence of the election 22 months after you've decided who the senator, the president, the congressman and congresswoman are. And that's nuts. But you have the paper. Bob, Bob Fetrakis and I had firsthand experience with that <clears throat> in 2004 in Ohio, where we sued and won. I was the plaintiff and Bob was the attorney, a plaintiff, there were many. And uh, uh, we won and the uh, uh, federal court ruled <clears throat> that all the 88 counties had to send their materials down to Columbus to a repository so that we could have a recount. <laughs> and 56 of the 88 counties failed to produce anything. Uh, they said that the coffee spilled on the ballots or they mistakenly put them out with the recycling or you know, it's out outrageous. One quick question here, uh, Russ. What is- Yeah, the... can, I, can I just say, I, I'm, yeah. on, I'm on somebody's uh, iPad, so it has a better camera than my, my, my laptop. I can't see, strangely, for the first time on a Zoom meeting, I can't see any questions down the side. I haven't got- right. that for... so, okay. so any questions, please let me know. Well, one was, what does Kill Chain mean? Uh, well, Kill Chain is explained at the end of the movie. So if you didn't get to the end of the movie, then you're going to be wondering what a kill chain is. It's a 2000 year old military um, strategy, which is how you take out your opponent by a series of links in a chain. You, you, you surveil, you find out their weaknesses, you find out the information you need to undermine those weaknesses. And finally you target and you destroy your opponent. And, the, the steps in how you can undermine an election really marry well with this military strategy. And it's well known to every intelligence service around the world. In fact, in the film, um, Senator Mark Warner says that one of Russia's top um, intelligence service officials said that they're changing in 2014, 15, that they're changing their attitude to how they regard America and other, and the rest of the world as enemies and cyber is one where they feel that Russia can always win. Well, uh, Gary Crane, you had a question? Yeah, am I unmuted? Yes, go ahead. Turn your video. Uh, yeah, I'll turn on my video, okay, hold on. Okay. Uh, so given this really uh, deplorable situation that uh, Brakey's incredible work, notwithstanding that we'll probably mitigate it uh, perhaps in Florida, to some extent, Arizona, North Carolina, the real question for me uh, at least, is this. What is your advice, Russ, uh, to, to Americans based on Erica Chenoweth's work, which I assume you're familiar with, and George Lakey's research, which some people here uh, may not be, although I've sent it to everybody, I think, on, on the thing, but basically his research showing that uh, a study of 12 democracies, eight of which were able to prevent a coup, and four of which, which failed, um, the lesson from those studies being that the ones that succeeded in preventing a coup, uh, they only did so by being able to organize in advance a huge nonviolent resistance army. Um, and that, that alone basically scared off the coup planners and they decided not to do it. Uh, what, what is your advice as to how we can um, foil the coup or if, it, if there is a coup, overturn it? based on, on those on the research I've just cited? I, I think um, Portland is a really good example of something that happened, which um, in the worst situation coming up, November, December, if things are going really wrong. In Portland, there was something that suddenly got reported differently to the rest of the, the protests there. There was a wall of moms. And these ladies looked like moms and they wore often yellow t-shirts and they linked arms and it was irresistible for the news. It was a pure people protest that was obviously not violent. They were moms and they'd organized 
and they decided they were going to be in front of the cameras in front between the police and the courthouse or other protesters who were being abused and i thought that that was an inspiring image for america to see because if that occurs in every county in every state where there's mm. let's let an election problem which which let's say roger stone decides to send some unpleasant people into florida to try and disrupt the election the image of a wall of moms and obviously men have a role in this too but it's it's an undeniably democratic image it's undeniably your right to protest and stand there as people who are not throwing tear gas who are not you know firing guns it's peaceful and it's powerful and i think that to organize that moms and dads however you present it to the press you they were people just like my sister my mom your auntie and I think that, that the, the ability to organize that kind of thing very quickly to protect the election anywhere where there's disruptive forces, let's say, street theater, that, that um, I think we saw in 2000, there was a riot called the Brooks Brothers Riot in Miami-Dade County that right. was organized by Roger Stone and it succeeded in stopping the count, which is astounding and awful. Um, there needs to be the peaceful protest on the other side of that, ready to go. Well, I mean, just, just to uh, quickly uh, clarify, we uh, at Get Courage Now are actually trying to help people like Indivisible and so forth, organize hundreds of walls of moms to protect the voting centers, to protect uh, Brooks Brothers riots in, uh, in the 50 key, key counties, protect the voting lines. But my question is, besides that, and by the way, anybody listening wanting to help us, we could use some help. Uh, besides that, if there is a coup uh, after the election and, and, and Trump is declared the winner, what can be done to prevent a, a 12th Amendment sc uh, scenario when it's being terribly contested for weeks afterwards and we want to prevent it going to the House and having a House vote uh, according to the 12th Amendment? What can, what can, what can a mass resistance uh, movement do to, pre to prevent that from happening? I mean, I that question is a little beyond me in terms of what what an entire country can do but i can see that one of the things you've had a problem with in america is having senators and congressmen and women who are brave enough to stand up and say this is wrong and if they feel that they are supported by their own voters by even people who never voted for them so you know a, a republican senator who's report who's supported by both republicans democrats and independents that seems to be the best thing. I think, you know, Trump's enablers need to feel that the, the democracy has its enablers. And so that the people who are in power will have the courage to oppose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, Steve Rosenfeld and then Mimi Kennedy. <clears throat> Steve, are you unmuted? Steve Rosenfeld? Uh, let's see, is he still with us? Uh, Steve, you're there. Harvey, I don't... Oh, here you go, here you go. Now I'm unmuted. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, wanted, I wanted to ask, go, Russ, go back to Russ and ask him more about some technology questions. Sure. Um, so the tabulation systems are one computer system, and we also have the e-poll books which is another data system. And um, my sense of the tabulation systems is since 2016, nobody's getting a look in the room unless you're a mem you work, you know, as, as for secretary of state or you're the county, you know, you're very senior staff. So we really don't know, you know, what's being done there or not, we really can't check it. John and I tried to check this in Detroit during the, uh, the, the Michigan primary. We just could not trace it once the, uh, the votes were sent over VPN to a central tabulating unit. But what we did see in a lot of places was um, disruptions with e-poll books, people logging in. We saw it in LA, we saw it in South Carolina. And, um, and I'm just one, and you know, if you, if you think about the, the, the landscape here, vote by mail is under attack. A lot of people are going to have to 
a lot of jurisdictions are going back to um, trying to re revive in-person voting in polling places. They're going to staff with National Guards and everything like that. But, but we saw that you, know, you could really, they're under, still going to be under-resourced. They're not getting money from Congress. So the pinch point there is when people try to check in. And that's the e-poll books. And, and that relates to voter registration databases, which, is, which we know and with this, we know that they were accessed and, and are vulnerable. So I'm just wondering, you know, what you've heard on that, because in some ways, um, a lot of this disruption does not necessarily, um, it doesn't, it, it, you know, it could, it could be like, well, let's change the tabulated results. But, but I've heard from people like Charles Stewart at MIT, that if you have long lines, one in six people leave, that's 16%. That's another way, very effective way of, of affecting the margins. So I'm just wondering what you may or may not have heard about when you were like oh, looking at, because you know, I, you have I, more research than I have on some of these technical things. Um, well, you know, and I'm not a scientist. I'm not a technician. I just listen and I ask questions of people I know, like Harry Hursty and Alex Holderman. Um, there's a company in Florida called Tenex, which I believe has provided the voter registration system for Cuyahoga County, the biggest, most important, massive voters in Ohio. Um, he, the owner of that company admitted to Harry Hursty in private that they hadn't really considered security. It was an afterthought. They're looking at it a bit now. They've sold the system through Florida. They've sold the system through Ohio and other places, I'm sure. And that, that is frightening, I think, because voter registration systems, as I'm sure you know, are, are necessarily online. They update themselves, people log in. There is also wireless connection, I believe, within a polling station to the equipment. Uh, and so, I mean, we do cover it in Kill Chain a little bit that if you just flipped part of people's address, it won't match. Um, it's, it doesn't, I don't know that it's happened, but it's certainly a aping vulnerability that's sit, just sitting there. Um, I don't know what you do about it, except if it goes down, make sure you have an alternative. Make sure that the, the polling place can get right back up and start again within minutes. Does that sound a reasonable answer? Because I'm not sure well, what else. Well, what we've seen is we've, we've seen it go down. We saw something like a third of the uh, transmissions from the central database in, in Secretary of State of California get interrupted in the in the Super Tuesday primary. And those disruptions lasted anywhere from like 20 to 40 minutes. We saw in a lot of places where they were using these new e-public systems by a company called No Inc in, in Georgia, which is basically an iPad-based interface. You know, they had trouble getting started at the beginning of the day. Those are, again, were, you know, the, the, the officials will tell you it's, it'll take an hour, everything's fine, we'll keep the polls open later, but still people leave. So, um, but I was just wondering, since, you know, you always do so much more research than you put into any film or any report, you know, what else you, you know, might have heard around some of this stuff. Um, we didn't focus on electronic poll books because, th th remember, through making this film, the new systems were coming in to replace the really old ones. And I had yeah. my work cut out to try and understand what Dominion's new system series of machines called image casts. Mm -hmm whether it's the one in the precinct or the one handling all the mail-in ballots, a super fast printer called the image cast central versus ESNS and versus um, Heart into Civic, the other two major voting machine manufacturers, what their systems were capable of. So I was kind of swamped with understanding old machines versus new machines and the ridiculous system where you, you have a touch screen, and you choose your your candidates and that spits out a little bit of thermal paper which then gets processed by yet another machine that ESNS provides at a great expense so I, I would say that as a Brit I have a different take on the lunacy of this Brexit was an amazing turnout I mean it ripped at my country apart to some extent but it was counted in 24 hours on paper People walked in. I've never seen a long line. I mean, I live on the edge of London. I'm not right in the middle, but I've never seen a long line of voters waiting and waiting and waiting to vote. If we can do it for Brexit, then Ohio can do it. California can do it. 
it, it isn't difficult. And I don't, I actually genuinely don't understand why you have long lines. Because we have Donald Trump. Uh, uh, anyway, but you had uh, them in 2004. Right. When that's you were in Ohio, you had them there. That's right. <laughs> but that, that's, it's all, it's all connected. Uh, um, okay, uh, Steve, is there more from you? <clears throat> But, well, Harvey, we had long lines because they took the machines. <laughs> they right. deliberately sent the machines out to the suburbs. And instead of eight machines in a precinct in the inner city, there were two. And well, the question broke. then becomes, <clears throat> in this election, um, will there be, a, when you do in-person voting, are you going to pay per ballot or are you going to have to do machines again? Is in-person yeah. voting in this election going to be done on paper? What are you talking about particular states? In Ohio, well, it's done on machine. Still, touchscreen machines. If you go in to vote in person in Ohio, are you going to get a paper ballot or is it going to be on a touchscreen machine? Actually, it depends on what county you're in. Russ is right. Uh, you've got a choice between the one you mark and they feed it in or the one where you push it marks for you on thermo paper, and they put that in uh, to be counted. And that's the one they're pushing because they claim it'll catch the overvote and undervote, uh, the machine marked ballot. So you're not voting on the same machine in the same county. You actually have a choice. But well, the ones which use the thermal piece of paper record your votes in a barcode. Yeah, it's barcodes insane. are not human readable, and it's the barcode that gets read by yet another machine. Again, well, also, they've worked in a, another dangerous um, you know, vulnerability potential. Now, in the in the age of the COVID, touchscreen machines should not be allowed because you can get the virus from the touchscreen machine. We should ins be insisting that all in-person voting be done on paper. I mean, that's that's a no-brainer, and uh, who knows what we're going to be confronting state by state, but that's something we're really gonna to have to deal with, right? Okay, Mimi Kennedy, and then Daniel Wolf. Yeah, hi Russ, it's a fantastic hi. film. Thank you, it's amazing. Thanks okay, Mimi, so, good to see you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. One is that appearances are, have become everything in politics and that's what most of our election officials want, a dog and pony show that looks beautiful, just like that whole Republican National Convention. I've never seen so much makeup and fashion in my life. Um, <laughs> I wanna ask you, yeah, and that's considered okay. Just show us a nice thing and we'll believe it and go about our business. The attitude, oh, I just wanted to remark that if senators knew the people were behind them, their voters were behind them, yeah, except for that gets us right back to the point where we are disconnected from our senators or anybody else we vote for. That link has been broken. So really every representative that supposedly voted in doesn't know if they were really voted in. And I think when we go to the streets, the police own the streets. They have the guns, they have the tanks. I don't see us winning in the streets unless we, you know, goes Rwanda. I just, I see us showing up in the streets and I see it creating a real wonderful, in some ways, culture of solidarity, but it's creating pushback from the people who steal our elections. So that's why we're here. The vulnerability is our elections. That's the vulnerability. So I just wanted to ask about public ownership. Since LA went that route, I want to know if you think public ownership, removing the vendor layer of lack of accountability is going to help us in any way. I mean, I realize it's a baby step. There are many more steps to go. But now the accountability lies with lies, the election office. It's their ass if the election is bad or the election is hacked. That said, our county owns our system. The state system is still, I don't know what, and we dropped 118,000 voters off the voter rolls in 2018 because there was a mismatch between the software that the DMV registers everybody and it goes to the state and then the state tells the county. And then if you register with the county, the county tells the state. Well, when they printed out the rolls, 118,000 names were lost in that dialogue. Some, they left them off somewhere. 
So I just wanted to bring up those two things and ask yep. you about public ownership and say the registration rules have been hacked. They are hacked. I've already seen problems with them that are inexplicable. Plus they don't match county to state. Can you talk about any of that? When I explain um, America's system a bit to anyone in, in England or anywhere else, I, the, the simplest thing that I can say that's happened to America's elections is they've been privatized. And it's such a simple thing that's shocking to say. It's such a simple phrase, um, but it's the truth. And we've tried very hard and so have others, and I know Susan Pinchon has as well, to find out the ownership of ESNS, Dominion Voting Systems, Heart into Civic as the three major ones. There used to be a fourth one, now there are only three major companies. And just the fact that it is damn hard, if not impossible, to find out not the company that owns, the company that provides it, but the actual people who own and are responsible for those companies. The fact that that's almost impossible to find out is your first clue as to why it's wrong, of course. So public ownership, you think, is a step forward in transparency? Yes, because, because election officials have to have the ultimate responsibility. They can't go, they should not, Number one is, is Ion Sancho in Florida said to us, well, I don't know what's in my system. I'm not allowed to look because of these words, trade secrets. Right. And the trade secret was the barrier, which also had, I think Bev Harris had, and I'm sure others had um, cease and desist legal letters thrown at them. You're putting something on your website that's our property. It may be just a line of code. It may be a link to something that's got something else in it. Suddenly there's a chill factor on trying to find out what the infrastructure is that is behind your elections and that must be public in a safe way i'm sure there are hackers who want to know dangerous stuff and you have to protect it from the bad people too but if the barrier is oh it's all trade secret we can't tell you any of this we can't even tell you um what tests have been done to prove it is safe there, there's a there's a that's just um, it's just ridiculous and, and the exit polls are privatized as well. That's why I sued Edison and said they're a state actor. If you're doing independent exit polls and you immediately adjust them to whatever the state says, no matter how absurd. So virtually everything in the system from the polling uh, to the vote counting is non-transparent and privatized. I would, I, it's very simple though, if you think of it this way, where is the profit motive? And if the answer is there isn't one, then to me, that's a very, very good thing. As soon as you have a profit motive for anything in elections, election officials are always going to try and regard their, you know, they have a tough job. I think it's a very complicated job. Sometimes they've got to deal with numerous different entities and legal problems, but they don't want their, their name on the front page of the Miami Herald unless it's a good article. They don't want to be in that spotlight. So they'll, they'll be as too careful but if you can say oh well no one's profit motive is going to be damaged because there isn't one i'd say that is an answer to half of your problems right um, I, i'd like to say something uh, if I, could. I just want to say bob and i put together a lawsuit against edison media research and just like the uh, election officials don't want anything bad to uh, be on their watch edison media research decided after 2004, where there were some disagreements with the exit polling, to massage the exit polls to fit the computer vote totals. So we lost another way to have a reflection of the truth. And, and what Russ said and Bob both said, you know, we're, we're talking about the profit motive. Okay, so, Daniel Wolf. <laughs> Then uh, Jennifer Tanner and Susan <clears throat> Daniel Wolf. I saw you in a car. There we go. Okay. Let's okay, go. good. <laughs> um, so at the risk of uh, sounding like a broken record, um, the, the, uh, we, 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 many of you have heard, but uh, Russ certainly hasn't. Um, you know, uh, we, my, my, Nonprofit tech company uh, has produced a self-help uh, system um, in order to get around the problem that we're facing right now, which is to say, we 
educate ourselves. We educate as many people as we can. You know, we put as many poll watchers at the polls. You know, we get out the vote, all of that sort of stuff. All of it is absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient um, because we can't guarantee or we can't ensure that we can expose errors. Uh, you know, we completely, Democracy Counts completely supports John Brakey's efforts, for instance, but it's not going to move fast enough. It's not going to scale fast enough to, to, to in, you know, for this year's election. Uh, so we've produced, for instance, these software tools that allow people to get out and actually verify that there are that, when, that there are no discrepancies or that there are discrepancies. So, for instance, we produced irrefutable evidence that 20% of our sample of, 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 of precincts in Broward County last March um, had reporting errors. The, the errors reported officially did not match the poll tapes. Uh, and and the uh, supervisor of elections office, the IT people there, the supervisor, the vice supervisor, could not explain it, and they made no effort to change the official results to match the poll tapes. And we're waiting on data for this coming week, or from last week, uh, by we should out next week, uh, to see whether that kind of error rate is holding it up, holding up. But the point is, is that if we see errors like this, then people with skin in the game, which is to say, candidates who stand to lose, you know, who suddenly have good direct evidence of discrepancies, which then they, they can take into court and ch and and challenge suspicious uh, results. And it also gives the public, you know, if they see indie independent third party data, uh, you know, saying that, you know, somebody that there was something weird going on, the discrepancies don't match up, the discrepancies are larger than the margins of victory and so on, that they suddenly have something reliable that they can use and argue. And if they want to go down to the courthouse or the, the elections office or, you know, the mayor's office or wherever to protest, they're doing it on the basis of not just speculation, not just suspicion about their political enemies, but actually solid evidence that needs to be investigated. All right. Thank you for that. I much appreciate We're down to um, 18 minutes. Um, uh, Jennifer Tanner. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Jennifer Tanner. Get you unmuted. And someone called Tina wants to ask a question I saw as yeah. well. Uh, Jennifer, then um, uh, Susan Pinchon, and then Tina. Okay, so Harvey, um, you asked the question that if the machines break down, well, then we should just have paper ballots. <clears throat> and here we are in Los Angeles, which Democratic, you would think we would have the least problems. So um, you would need to have ballot in demand printers in order to print ballots because a lot of people are coming to one location now in these voting centers and you would need a ballot in demand printer and that you have to like organize way, way, way in advance. Um, uh, I worked with Trent Lang, uh, clearing money, complaining to Padilla that there were a lot of problems with our VSAP. And one of them is we were promised handmarked paper ballots and we didn't get them. And he's like, don't worry, we'll have them. And that was before March. What they gave us, and they didn't even tell anybody that they were there are these forms that you have to fill out yourself. Every single one, you'd have to bring your own ballot and copy and each single thing. It's impossible, nobody would wanna do that. It would take you 20, 30 minutes to fill out your ballot. And so there's no way, and that's just Los Angeles, that's number one. So all you have, there is no paper ballots. And-, and Are you breaking up on us, Jennifer? All right, uh, Jennifer, uh, are you speaking? Okay, we'll have to come back to you, Jennifer, if you'll uh, fix your um, uh, audio. But if your point is well taken. <clears throat> this is a major issue. If we're, if we're urging people to early vote, we don't want them to go into the election uh, centers, which are now gonna be in arenas, which is a good thing, but to be confronted with touchscreen machines or unworkable <clears throat> paper, this is a big deal. You know, if uh, we're getting cut off on um, mail-in ballots and we're, we're asking people to uh, take the step of going in there, what are they going to get? Um, uh, that's a major problem. Jennifer, are you back with us? Okay, um, uh, Susan Pinchon. Susan, uh, Jennifer, you can come back if you can. Yes, hi. Hi again, Harvey. I just quickly wanted to, I was asked a specific question before, so I didn't welcome my friend Russ Michaels, and I just wanted to say something about Russ. You know, all of us have been, a lot of us have been studying and working uh, and towards fair elections 
fair and transparent and accurate elections for many years now. And Russ is extraordinary because he's self-taught, sort of a British Abraham Lincoln, you know, working by the midnight oil, because he, he has an incredible amount of knowledge and he's done it by studying and by Googling and by talking to people and asking questions. So that's one thing I'd like all of, to encourage all of us to do and I think most of us do try to do that, get out of our echo chambers and really keep doing independent research, keep looking up these things, keep trying to figure out what's going on. And then, then se the second thing I just wanted to address quickly is the whole privatization issue. Because when you think about it, from the fact that the voting machine vendors pay the testing laboratories themselves to test their machines, how crazy is that? To the counting of the votes, to the poll books, to the, um, uh, printing of ballots, to the sorting of ballots, to the distribution of ballots. So many of these things are privatized and it's something that there's no quick answer to, but as Mimi pointed out, it's something that really needs to be looked at. And I know Los Angeles has tried to do that. And there still are vendors involved, right, Mimi? And, and, and there's still profits that were made by companies, there's, even yeah. in the publicly owned it's, system. It's that is that About government contracts, which has been a problem of corruption since the founding of our country and earlier. Whoever gets the government contract to make the stuff that LA owns and is responsible for. It's a government contract because our LA County, you know, elected officials and appointed officials don't have, they can't build stuff on them on their own. But, uh, you know, yes, in a short view, somebody gets the government contract and yes, there can be corruption there, but then it's on the LA registrar and election offices if they receive crap that runs a bad election. That's the legal, uh, goodness of publicly owned, it removes that. Well, the vendor did it. They can still argue that, but it's on them that they didn't check their vendor's stuff. Uh, Tina Huang, and then we'll return to Jennifer Tanner. All right, thank you so much for taking my question. I just wanna give a huge shout out to all of you who have done so much work on this um, issue. I've been following it for well over a decade and, and have been trying to raise awareness and done my own part as well. Um, so I'm very grateful to get to actually see many of you in, on, uh, in person in this way. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you, I love that the movie was brilliant, absolutely brilliant, Russ. And, and it's actually, this is not a question, it's a suggestion that, that came up as, um, as this was, as you were talking earlier about what England does. And I've heard about the great stories of going to the banks and like, you know, really making this whole counting system very open. And I'm wondering if you, um, it's just an idea, if you'd be willing to create a movie that contrasts what's possible versus what we do. I think that we, we really need to see, like I think uh, Michael Moore did a fantastic job of that with his, I forget which movie it is, but um, he goes out and shows us what's possible. And that's part of what the United States I think is suffering from is that we see how broken we are, but we don't, we don't understand what's possible. And so I'd just like to invite you to do that, but I do have a couple of other questions as well. Yeah, very well, quickly, who that should was, we that invade was... next? Yes. That very quickly, because I know we're running out of time. That was Sicko, and Michael Moore came to look at the British health system, and he he got a prescription for something, and it was it was I think it was free, or they gave him a refund. So yeah, he actually, was, he was was, who do we invade next? I think was the next was was the uh, he's done maybe a couple movies then on that. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so uh, where to invade next? I yes. think. I think one of the problems, very quickly, one of the problems is how much can you fit into a film that HBO, for example, will commission? And how do you, how do you make it so that the people who, who have no interest in this will be grabbed from the beginning? And it's very difficult to say, aha, you see, as a Brit, for me to come along and say, and my co-producer here is Simon Arzazzoni, for us to say, you know, America, you've got it all wrong. You should do what we're doing. It can be quite condescending. And it, it, it's a delicate thing when you're, when you're coming into another country and saying, your system's really not very good and we need you to think about it. So I, just as a Brit, it. so it comes it's different for an American to come here and, yeah. and have a look at what we're doing. But for me to tell you that my country's doing it better than your country could have an off-putting effect. I just wanted to say that. Right. But if yeah. you have a quick question, I know we're running out of time. <clears throat> I'm not sure Boris Johnson is all that much to brag about at this point. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I Tina, did, you want to, 
Did you want to add something else and then we'll go back to Jennifer? A we question? have exactly 10 minutes left. Yeah, I have a really important thing to say. Um, I, my background, I have a background in computer science, but I'm very interested in integrity issues and study the subconscious mind. And so one of the things I, I, I'm looking at is that there's just a lot of in, lack of integrity going on, right? And, and that, could, that could be whether it's hackers, there's so many different directions this comes from, right? Whether it's Russians or even the election officials. And one thing that Dan Ariely, who is famous for his work in integrity and how do you get people to be at their best, has shown repeatedly in, in I can't remember the movie he's written, but um, that, that, you know, for example, with taxes, if, if people fill out their tax forms and sign at the end and say they haven't, they haven't cheated, it doesn't work. They have to say at the very beginning that I'm not going to cheat and then do their taxes. And it's so much more effective when you ask people upfront that, you know, to, to be in, in line with integrity. And what I'm thinking is, can you use that information to, um, in fact, we've done this, I live in Washington, we've done this with our, um, uh, oh shoot, we just had a lot we're, of- We're out of time, so just, just to be fair on anyone who's still got a question. Go quickly, Tina. Tina, we're almost out of time. I'm, I know, I'm trying to get to the point. So what my point is, is, is can you set a code that, um, that says, okay, here's the requirements for integrity and then judge and rate each county or each precinct based on that code and say, hey, you know, oh, this, you know, it's kind of like, um, like uh, fair trade or, um, you know, people meet certifications so that we can rank them. We can, you know, I can go to a database and go, oh, this one follows, um, you know, is, is a really good, you know, it will, will meet this code of conduct and I don't have to worry about their integrity, at least this year. All and right, I that's an interesting idea. Other ones don't. Thank you for that, Tina. Thank you. I think very quickly, I think if there was a, a sort of rainbow of four colors or five colors where, you know, the, the, the people who, who had the most open system, the most transparency, answered questions from voters, got further up that, it would be something for others to aim for. You don't want to be black. You want to be green at the top. You don't want to be red. You want to be green. So it, it, it could be something where you could tar them with a bad reputation on a, on a chart. If, that's the all I can think of. You have... You yeah. have things that represent transparency and openness, and the people who aren't following that get a bad score. That, that, I just that want to say it's called, right okay. it's called Honest Elections in Seattle. We have Honest Elections in Seattle. It's worth looking up, but there's financial incentives behind it. It's so cool. So very, okay. very worth looking up. Very good, very good. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, thank you, Tina. Thank you much. Jennifer, did you want to get in a word? and then? We'll yeah, yes, I did. Um, so I think I finished with the ballot and demand printers, but something that Mimi was saying about public ownership, I guess uh, the VSAP in Los Angeles is publicly owned, but it was promised to be open source, which would allow us to have it not be privatized. So even though it's publicly owned, and I'm not sure who that ownership is, it's not open source and we can't validate it. It was promised and now he's, Dean Logan has taken that back. And the other thing that's important is that Dean does not understand the value of hand-marked paper ballots. He feels that the ballot marking device is the hand-marked paper ballots and is replacing hand-marked paper ballots, which is why it's, uh, it's difficult to convince him of the so solidity and the validity of a handmark paper ballot for auditing. I just, and, just okay. want to mention this year, every California is getting a handmarkable paper ballot in the mail. So I, I, I agree, I agree, but I'm talking about the block market. Oh, I totally of understand course. what you're saying. That's, but, but we have now spent first 300 million and now blah, blah, add on $900 million for the ballot marking device that is hackable and is supposed to replace handwrite paper ballots. Mm -hmm. That's a travesty. It is. Uh, 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 Mimi, did you want to jump in on that? And then Susan Pinchon and then we're- Well, uh, the 900 million also covered these e-poll books and that's what we're asking about. That stopped all the provisional voting. <laughs> There's a lot to be done yet. Yes, I agree with you, Susan, but this year is an amazing laboratory for California, every single active voter. And there's an issue behind that because some are inactive that shouldn't be, but every active voter is getting a hand-markable paper ballot that they can take and mark at a polling place if they want to. And uh, except for on election day, don't try to drop it off on election day, but it no, early vote. No, we've got to urge that people, if you're bringing in a ballot, go before election day. A lot of these arenas actually are gonna not be open on election day, which makes no sense, but they are doing them for early voting. Susan Pinchon, real quick. <laughs> Yes, really quickly, I, I do want to urge everyone to ask their election officials to save ballot images. I want to thank John Brakey.
for all the work he's done in 20 states on uh, towards that goal and towards coalition building in those states. And please do believe that ballot images could really make a difference in this November's election if the election is um, contested by anyone up to our up to the president himself. So um, they are really important for public confidence and a big thank you to John for all his work on that. Thank, yeah. uh, thank you for the time. It, it would uh, be great. If Russ, Russ and John, if you could collaborate on something specific to the ballot imaging technologies, that would be really good. A memo specific I would, I would love to. to the hackability of ballot imaging technologies. Did you want to say something, Russ? I, I did want to say, I, I just just for anybody who came late, there's somebody I saw a little message popped up which said, where can I see Kill Chain? The, the full title is Kill Chain, the Cyber War on America's Elections. It's currently on HBO for download. I mean, I can't get HBO in Great Britain, frankly, to see my own film. Um, but uh, I believe Laurie, has been giving out a private Vimeo link where we we said you could just watch the film this way for this conference. So uh, if, if anyone wants to get in touch with Laurie for the moment, for a short amount of time, you can watch the film that way. Just wanted to yes. let everybody. Very uh, much David so. Schlesinger, can you do this in, in, in 30 seconds? Yes. Real quick, please. Yeah. Uh, I really like the film, and I'm much more open to the possibility that Russians were involved in 2016. But why was the American press, and maybe somebody else should answer this, so focused on the Russian issue having to do with who gave Hillary's emails to uh, WikiLeaks, which seems irrelevant? Okay. Well, the, I think Thank the quick you. answer to that is there was a hack, a genuine hack, at the beginning of this entire story, and it was John Podesta's emails and... That, that made emails a meme and a, a thing that the, the other side pounced on. You know, it, it was a red herring. The fact that there were hacked emails um, was, was a, the real story. So, you know, it depends how much fuel you put into a story that, d did Hillary Clinton destroy some emails? If she did, all right, let's look into it. But it didn't affect the election in terms of the count or Russian interference. It right. was other emails that were hacked that were put out as weaponized, weaponized data, weaponized emails. Okay, listen, we're down there. We've got two minutes. Thank you so much. Tomorrow night, there will be another Zoom at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, email me at solartopia <laughs> at gmail. It'll be our 16th election protection Zoom. And uh, they, we, we really have been getting down to the nitty gritty. Lori Grace, thank you yes. so much for joining us. Uh, uh, I'd like to say a word. Being here, uh, Russ Michael, it's a fantastic film. I, I really you. wish if you and John can get together and give us a definitive memo on the hackability of electronic uh, ballot imaging, that would be a big, big plus. Uh, this has been a spectacular group. Uh, thank you so much. Thank may you I may I say something, please, Harvey? Please. Okay. Yeah. I want to say that I'd like to find a way. I'm not a tech tech person. I want to put this recording on trustvote.org and I, you know, I'll talk to whoever I need to. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, we will have another meeting and another person that I'd like to include is Ray Lutz, who's putting together a fairly inexpensive way of counting ballot images. So uh, I'm just letting you know, stay in touch with trustvote.org, O-R-G. Very good, and we'll see you tomorrow night on the um, uh, uh, Grassroots Emergency Election Protection uh, Coalition uh, call. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Email me to get on. Lori, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Russ, great. Uh, uh, a great film, and uh, do, do collaborate with John and the others. Thank you so much, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you for uh, having me. <laughs>